Hello Internet, it is me again, Alex from Barefaced, and I have the Guitar Cab prototype that we were talking about a few videos ago, so this is kind of part three of that series. And I do believe we had got onto prototype number two, which was this single driver concept, which started from hacking up one of our 110 cabs and trying this basic precursor of the AVD in it. And what we found with this one was that it tuned too high and it didn't sound quite right, but we felt there was potential, that there was somewhere it could go. So then we made some more. And in the end, we had a few different variants. So there's this one here, which actually has a curved horn. So you can see, uh, you can see the curvature quite clearly there. Um, we had this one here, straight sided. And you can see we've changed the, the shape. We've gone, to, we've gone to a sort of shorter, wider design, really for aesthetics and the size of what lunchbox guitar amp heads tend to be like. So it was like, okay, let's. If you're going to design cabinets, you want to design cabinets that look good underneath the amps that people are likely to be using. That matters. Now, you don't want to compromise the acoustics to do that. But conversely, you don't want to produce a product that no one buys because it looks silly. You know, this is rock and roll or, you know, variants and relatives thereof. And very few people talk about going to listen to a band. They go to see a band. So what stuff looks like matters, which is why our gear looks good. So there we have, as you can see, obviously this hole here is where the rear dish, the input plate goes. So that is basically a solid piece and this is the gap here that sound comes out of. Now you may be wondering why we'd want sound coming out of here and that really comes out of the fact that speakers have a front and a back and when the front of the speaker produces sound inevitably the back of the speaker because it's a the cone has two sides to it is producing sound it's producing vibrations so it's producing everything from the low frequencies to the high frequencies it's not producing the very highest frequencies because that is actually coming from this bit here. So this is what's called the dust caps, a little dome that's either attached to the cone itself, the center of the cone, or to the end of what we call a voice coil former, which is what the, the electromagnet, the coil that's inside is wound on. But as you can see at the back of the speaker, you can see here we have the magnet. So the metal work of the magnet and the motor is behind the very centre of the speaker. But then we have the gaps around the outside where the frame is. Let's see if we can get that lit. I should probably have grabbed a bare speaker. So next video I shall do that and wave one of those around. And then you can see how our cone has two sides. Front and a back. Sound comes off the front and sound comes off the back. Now. In this earlier prototype, we talked about how this side was like a conventional ported box, Helmholtz resonator, so it's got one low frequency resonance, and this side was at low frequencies acting as an open enclosure, essentially, because there's lots of air gaps here, with this acting as a diffractor, so that splits the wave and sends it sideways, and also this helping couple it to the room in the form of a sort of mid-range horn that improves the gain and also widens the, the dispersion, so helps with directivity. And what we've done with these variants here is attempted to get this slot, the air mass sitting in this slot and sitting somewhere into this horn, to act as a resonant mass and the air within the enclosure to act as our air spring that this mass is pressing on via the area of the slot here and try to get a resonant frequency that works. Now, any loudspeaker it inherently has its own high-pass filterness to it. So as the speaker is driven to lower frequencies, it rolls off. So if that's your What's the best way around? Well, anyway, say that's highs and that's lows. And the lows, it will always do that inevitably due to the nature of resonant things. Once you drive it below the speak zone resonance, it rolls off. Now, if you 
put a port in, you can extend that low frequency response by getting the port to be tuned where the speaker's rolling off, so you get a bigger sound. Now, you may think that if this is for guitar, why do we need low frequencies? But it's easy to forget that the guitar is actually an instrument that goes quite far into the bass register. So low E on a standard tuned guitar is 82 hertz. Not many people can sing that low. You may notice if you've looked at standard notation that guitar parts are written on the treble clef, but they're written an octave higher than they sound. So they sound an octave lower. So it is a, it is a low pitched instrument, it really is. And so speakers, guitar speakers have these resonances which tend to be in this 50 to 100 hertz range. And because of the way guitar speakers are, they tend to start rolling off well before the speaker's free air resonance once the speaker is placed in the box. Because the air spring, so this is, this is an interesting thing when we're talking about cabs. I've talked about this air mass sitting on an air spring to be our Helmholtz resonator. So that's our port, our supplementary resonance to deal with the low frequencies. That air inside the box also acts as an air spring pushing on the speaker cone. So that air spring pushes on the speaker cone and you can probably imagine, if you do a bit of thinking, that if you imagine yourself standing on a board which has got one spring supporting it and try to bounce up and down, it will have a certain natural resonance. Imagine if you add another spring, that will increase the spring stiffness and when you bounce up and down, it will want to bounce more quickly. So you've added spring stiffness, but you haven't changed anything else. And that's what happens to a guitar speaker in a box. Because it's a big speaker with a lot of area, there's a lot of air pushing on it. If you had a speaker with the same cone mass, but smaller area, then less of the air in the box would be pushing on it, so the resonant frequency wouldn't get pushed up as far. So this is what happens in guitar cabs. The lows tend to roll off. Um, this is closed back guitar cabs. The rolls, lows tend to roll off and we want some of those lows to come back in and that's why we've got this Helmholtz resonance part of the AVD helping out. So there's that straight slot there. We did, where is it? That straight slot but curved horn quite complicated to machine, as you can imagine. And what we found was, we didn't like how the mids behaved with this. There was a certain honkiness that was going on. This is approximately a Tractrix horn, which certainly, I don't know if PV held the patent on, or do or don't, but it was something along those lines, a sort of hybrid of a hyperbolic horn and a, and a conical horn. This one was tuning too high, and this cavity was sounding resonant in ways we didn't want, mid-range resonances. Um, this one was sounding good in the mids, nice straight horn, also tuning too high. Now, to make it tune lower, what we can do is narrow the slot, which therefore means there is less area of spring pushing against this air mass. So although you're reducing the mass of air by narrowing this, you're reducing the area by more. So the mass is dropping that it's pushing against, but the spring rate is dropping more, so you actually end up with a lower tuning frequency. What we found though, was that if you make this too narrow, you start to get an acoustic low pass filter effect um, due to the resistance of the air in the slot. So that's effectively working like some sort of acoustic inductor. So that's rolling off the highs. So it's not letting through the higher mid-range frequencies that, we, that are coming off the back of the cone. We really want to let through and out into the room. So then we tried, I'm quite pleased with this idea, we realized that when you're looking at the back of a speaker, in the middle of the speaker, the magnet's getting in the way. So most of the mids and highs coming off the back of the speaker are coming off near the top and the bottom of the slot. So therefore, we've kept the top and the bottom of the slot wide to stop the low pass filter effect blocking those higher frequencies, but we've narrowed the center of the slot 
to get the tuning frequency where we want. And once we'd got that, we were quite impressed with how this one sounded. It really did sound very good. It had this magical way that as you rotated the cab, you lost a bit of top end, but not a lot. So you were losing the dust cap output that I've already referred to, that central dome thing, but you were getting all of that, that cone output through the mid-range and upper mid-range, and obviously the lows are always omnidirectional off a, a small speaker like this. Um, you have to go to enormous, enormous speakers for, for lows to become directional and more realistically get a, do use cardioid arrays to, con to sort of steer low frequencies. Um, but yeah, this sounded good. So then we did the sensible thing to do with this because guitar is a subjective thing. We did a whole load of blind testing with everyone here who plays guitar, um, swapping between cabs, trying them, making notes, scoring things and reporting back. And the rather nice thing was pretty much everyone agreed that this one did what we wanted to do. It got the tuning frequency where we wanted, it made the mids and highs sound how we wanted. And nice thing about this design, in a, so this is a, a 10. We started with a 10 because we thought, well, why not go small? I mean, 12 is more popular for guitar, but let's, let, let's start with the smallest thing possible and get, make a 10 that sounds big like a 12. This ply we use is actually slightly, we use a, a, a stiffer, better ply now, so we've just improved since then. But um, stiffer, better, but no heavier, actually, so it's rather nice stuff. Um, it's still a nice, rigid enclosure. What we've got here is that because the panels are low in mass but high in stiffness, it moves the resonance frequency up nice and high, so it's easy to control and damp. The other thing we've got in, is that these panels here essentially brace the top and the bottom in sort of non-regular ways. So it means that if you do have resonances, they move frequency a lot. Um, and then inside the box, any internal reflections, instead of them being just off a back wall and therefore all at being at the same wavelength, because you think normally sound comes off a speaker and goes back, bounces back and forth, so you end up with this standing wave between here, like that, yeah? That becomes a standing wave that dominates, and as well as you've got your up, down and your left, right standing wave. By having this in here, the front back standing wave is of lots of different lengths, and the side to side standing wave is also of lots of different lengths. And bear in mind the speaker sticks into this, so the side to side standing wave is broken up by the speaker as well. Um, and then top to bottom, yes, you've got panels, but it's not that much of the cab compared to a normal box. So it really made. And why do those internal standing waves matter? You may be wondering because a speaker cone is quite thin material, you can easily listen through it and shout through it, so therefore anything that comes off the back, bounces around, can come back out through the speaker. And if it's coming direct from the speaker, say that's at zero milliseconds, anything that's coming out, having bounced around the box, is slightly delayed. So you then end up with notch filtering, and basically if you had a speaker producing a flat fr frequency response, I mean a guitar speaker doesn't, but imagine that the perfect tone was a flat frequency response. Once you put bounces through the box, it does this to it. You end up with all these bits. And that's happening to our guitar speaker, and it just makes things sound blurry and muddy. So this box inherently gives you a better tone off the front of the speaker, because the rear reflections are less compromised without having to fill it with loads of damping material because that it's not really what you want with guitar speakers. There needs to be a certain sort of liveliness to it. Um, we don't want to damp down the Q at low frequencies too much. That's for another video, Q. That's a, quite an interesting field. But yeah, we got it tuning how we wanted, so the low frequencies sounded right. Again, I shall have to delve into the mysteriousness of Q and resonances at low frequencies in another video. We got the mids and highs coming out of the back sounding right. The mids and highs, as I explained from the front, already sounding better than from a normal cab. And uh, we felt we were rather onto a winner. So I'll wrap up there. I've finished in quite a, a sensible spot. Ask me questions, because I'm sure I've missed some stuff. I'm sure I've left some sort of puzzling gaps. Um, and I'm sure some of that might have been puzzling if you don't happen to have a degree related to this or be running a business like this. So 
Um, and then I shall continue more with some of these other subjects that relate, so ports and resonances, and I'll also diverge on some tangents. But yeah, thank you, thank you for listening. Tell people about us, because we know what we're doing, and if you are fancying spending some money on some guitar or bass gear, this is probably the best way to get better tone, whether you're gigging or recording, and thus play better. That's the subject for another video. Why better tone makes you play better. Anyway, I'll sign off for now. Thank you. I have been Alex from Barefaced, and this was another episode of awesome cab-waving geekery. Goodbye. <laughs>